Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody have a good weekend? Awesome. Um, so, we have our third exam coming up uh, this week, Wednesday and Friday. Um, so, my job today is to answer any questions that I can in regards to that exam. Y'all have the Unit 3 review. Uh, you have previous quizzes, previous homeworks. Um, all that material you can look uh, refer to for questions. So, um, what can we look at? Is there something that in particular that somebody wants to look at in regards to exam 3? Can we do number eight? From the review? Yes. Sure. Let's do number eight. Okay. So, from Unit 3 Review, problem number 8, uh, we have the function f of x is equal to a 4x squared over an x squared minus 1. Okay, um, so, you know, real quickly, I'm going to, I noticed that the denominator is the difference of two squares, so I'm going to go ahead and factor that. And um, just for reference purposes, we're going to call this p of x over q of x. And if we want to go through the um, A through I, let's begin here at A. Uh, let's deal with domain. And um, before I deal with domain, actually, let's come back here to B because that will make more sense if we deal with B. Uh, the vertical asymptotes, um, to find those, you're going to set Q of X equal to zero. So if you have x plus 1 times an x minus 1 set equal to 0, that would then mean that x is equal to 1 and x is equal to negative 1. Um, maybe I should do it in the order that it appears. x equals negative 1 and x is equal to 1. You set each of those equal to 0. So here are your vertical asymptotes. Now remember, the vertical asymptotes are... Uh, where the function does not exist. Um, it's where, um, basically it's where you get zero in your denominator and you cannot have zero in your denominator. So what is our domain? Um, our domain is everything from negative infinity to negative one, unioned with everything from negative one to one, unioned with everything from one to infinity. Basically, we're declaring that it can be anything from negative infinity to infinity, but it can't be negative 1 or 1. C, uh, what is the horizontal asymptote? So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the degrees of P of X and Q of X. So uh, the degree of P of X is equal to 2. The degree of Q of X is also equal to 2. So since 2 is equal to 2, since the degrees are equal to each other, that means that Y is equal to A over B. Um, I'm just using these notations uh, to say what is A? A is the leading coefficient of your numerator. So that's 4. B is the leading coefficient of your denominator, that's 1, so that means that Y is equal to 4 is our 
horizontal asymptote. D, find any x-intercepts. Find any x-intercepts, you set P of x equal to zero. So that's a four x squared is equal to zero. Well, that just means that x is equal to zero. So there's our x-intercept. Now, E says, um, you know, oh yeah, E says find a y-intercept. Well, I already know that since I have an x-intercept at zero, I'm going to have a y-intercept at zero. Um, but just for the purposes of noting how you do this, you evaluate the function at zero. So that gives you a four times a zero squared over a zero squared minus one. Well, that's going to give you zero up top, negative one down below. So that is Um, that does mean that y is equal to 0. There is our y-intercept. And uh, I'm going to come over here to graph to do part f. Part f says the graph. So I like to start off by plotting my uh, asymptotes. Um, so let's declare that this is negative 2, negative 1, 1, 2. So we have vertical asymptotes at negative 1 and positive 1. Um, I have a y-intercept at 4. And, you know, I'm just going to declare this to be 4 right here. Notice how I'm not necessarily keeping my scale the same. Uh, I just find this a bit more convenient. Um, but notice I am labeling all the parts of my graph. And the only thing I know right now is that I have a y-intercept at 0. All right, so we got to do some work. Um, now, I can pretty much tell you that the graph is going to be like this um, for anything to the left of negative 1 or to the right of positive 1 because the graph can't cross down through the x-axis anymore. In fact, we can do a quick proof. Um, if I do... Let's just do a test value, f at, let's say, negative 10. Well, that's going to be 4 times a negative 10 squared over a uh, negative 10 squared minus 1. So that's going to be negative 10 squared is 100, so you have 400 over... Uh, 99, which is um, uh, approximately 4. Approximately 4. Um, so, in fact, it's, it's actually going to be greater than uh, 4. So it's going to be a 4 point something. So there, that just, that should establish why the graph has to be looking like this. And as it approaches that vertical asymptote, it has to go up. And since, since all we're doing is doing it the 10 squared, you're going to get the same thing here. Negative 10 squared is the same thing as positive 10 squared. So you're still going to get this approximately 4 something. I don't have my calculator with, I mean, I haven't pulled it out, but you can get the exact value. It's going to do something like this. And now the question is, what is my function doing um, here? Is it going to go like this? 
it going to go like this? Is it going to bounce? Let's find out. Well, the interesting thing is up here in the numerator, we have a repeated zero. Um, that x is being squared, so that tells me that the graph is going to bounce. Now, is it going to be above or below the x-axis? I don't know. So we got to find out. So again, let's pick some values to plug in. Um, and maybe I should give out my calculator here because we're about to deal with some... Uh, I don't, maybe I don't need my calculator. Let's see if we can do this with our calculator. F at a negative one-half. So that's going to be 4 times a negative one-half squared over a negative one-half squared minus 1. All right, so one-half times one-half is a fourth. So we have 4 times a fourth over a fourth minus 1. So that's 1 over a negative 3 quarters, which is negative. Oh, so since it's negative, that means it exists below the x-axis. And since, again, all the only x's that we have are the ones that are being squared, since the only x's that we have are the ones that are being squared, this means also that if you do f at positive one half, you're still going to get the four times a fourth over a fourth minus one, which is still going to come out to be one over a negative three fourths. So that's also negative. So that means, just like I said, because this zero up here in your numerator is repeated, multiplicity of two means it bounces we can do our graph like this. All right, before I answer those last questions, um, I know I went through that, felt like I went through that really quickly. Are you, especially to the person that asked this question, uh, everybody on board? Yes. All right, so then I would just finalize this uh, problem uh, EFG as X is approaching negative 1 from the right. So as we're going to negative 1 from the right, you're on the right side of negative 1, the graph is going to F of X is approaching negative infinity. It's going down. Um, that's G. H as x is approaching 0, f of x is approaching, well, as x gets closer to 0, as we go to 0 and along the x-axis, the graph is also approaching 0. And i, as x approaches infinity, <coughs> f of x, so as my x's go out in this direction, my x go out this direction. This graph is going to get closer and closer and closer to this horizontal asymptote, which is at 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're very welcome. What else can we look at? Any other questions?
Um, you know, just recalling uh, what Unit 3 is about. Um, you have uh, the roots of polynomials. So that's going to be your uh, synthetic division. Process to find roots. Uh, graphing polynomials. Uh, graphing rational functions. Um, then we have polynomial and rational inequalities. And then we transition into exponents and logarithms. So you have exponential and logarithmic functions that also includes graphing properties of logarithms uh, so expanding and condensing And then uh, exponent and logarithmic equations. Um, you know, in properties of logarithms, I mean, there's uh, things like evaluate logarithms and stuff like that. Um, so just be aware of um, just trying to, this was just off the top of my head, remembering everything that was covered. Uh, in unit three. All right, back to the floor. Is there anything else that we can look at either from the review or uh, anything else? Anything can else we do 24? 24. Um, so, uh, in the instructions, it says where possible, evaluate the logarithmic expressions without a using a calculator. So that means anytime that you can do something to simplify it even further, make sure you do so. So take a look at this. Log base six. Oh, sorry, that's 23. Um, log base 4 of the square root of x over a 64y. All right, so when I first look at this, I see my division bar. So that means I want to use my quotient rule. So this becomes the log base 4 of the square root of x minus the log base 4 of 64y. Um, I can rewrite this uh, square root as an exponent. And um, because we have a multiplication there, we can use the product rule. And make sure that when you think about this, and if it helps, 
think about how that minus sign is going to distribute. So oftentimes I'll start off by just putting it in a set of brackets or another set of parentheses. And then we'll think about, oh, that minus sign is going to distribute to those two terms, giving us the log base 4 of x to the 1 half minus the log base 4 of 64 plus, or excuse me, minus the log base 4 of y. So final things that we can do, we can use the power rule to bring that one half out in front of the co as a coefficient. And this is where in the instructions it says, where possible, evaluate each logarithmic expression without using a calculator. This can, this can be evaluated. Because what this is asking is this, 4 to what power is 64? That's what the log expression is doing. It's asking for the power of the base to get you to 64. And what do you have to raise 4 to to get 64? The answer is 3. And there is our final answer. So do you see how, you know, because of the log base 4, we can actually evaluate this logarithm? If, this is just an if, if it was, let's say, the natural log of the square root of x over 64y, all you could do, all you could do to get there would be one half natural log of x minus the natural log of 64 minus the natural log of y. If it was a natural log function, we couldn't simplify this. Uh, natural log of 64, I mean, I don't even know what it is. You have to use a calculator there. Um, but because we can evaluate this without using a calculator, this, this works out really nicely here. We can simplify the log base 464 to just be the three. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. What else can we look at? Can we go over 14? 14. <laughs> well, isn't 14 just this right here? Yeah. Does that make sense? Do I need to go over yeah. that again? No. How about 16? 16 looks a little bit challenging. Log base 16 of 4. Well, I mean, by now, you know, some of us may be saying, oh, I know the answer to this. But some of us may still be struggling with this idea of how do you evaluate this um, without a calculator? Well, Everything hinges on this idea that the log base b of, of x equal to y is equivalent to b to the y is equal to x. Everything hinges on this uh, equivalency, this relationship between the logarithmic form and the exponential form. So if I just go ahead and set this log base 
16 of 4 equal to y, I can then use this form up here to rewrite it in the exponential form. So this becomes 16 to the y is equal to 4. All right, so what do you have to raise 16 to? What power do you have to raise 16 to to get 4? Well, here's what goes on inside my head. I don't know what goes on inside your head, but I'm going to dare to show you what goes on inside my head. I know that 4 squared is equal to 16. So then that leads me to the thought that, okay, this, that means the square root of 16 is 4, which means that if I take 16 to the 1 half, that gives me 4. That's what goes in, inside my head. That's, that's the process that I go through. So that, you know, the square root of 16 is 4. I can rewrite square root with a rational exponent of 1 half. So that means that y must be 1 half. y has to be equal to 1 half. So what's the answer to this problem? The answer is 1 half. If I were you, when I say you, I'm thinking to all of y'all, almost the very first thing that I would write on my test would be this right here. I mean, you might have some other things that you want to write down on this test to help you um, recall some information, but this would be one of the very first things, especially if I'm struggling with remembering it. Memorize it, know it, and then write it down. Uh, know, you got to know how to use it. But this would be one of the very first things I'd write down on my test. Just somewhere up there in the corner on scratch paper or whatever, put it on the test. All right, what else can we look at? Can you do 31? 31. You'll need your calculator out for this one. So we have e to the 12 minus 5x minus 7 is equal to 123. So when I look at this equation, I notice that the variable that I want to solve for is up here in the exponential position, um, the only way that I can bring that variable out of the exponential position, um, and this is something that's just going on in my head, if I have e to the x is equal to a, then I can take the natural log on both sides, which allows me to apply the power rule And since the natural log of e is just equal to 1, that gives me x is equal to the natural log of a. So this is the process. This is something that I want to do in my solving in order to bring the x, the variable, out of the exponential position. But before I can do this, the first thing I need to do is I need to isolate... the e to the x, or the e to the 12 minus 5x in this case. So to do that, um, let's just add the 7 to both sides. So 123 plus 7 is going to be a 130. Now, I can't do anything with that 12, I can't do anything with that negative 5 right now because, again, they're up there in the exponential position. So I'm going to take the natural log on both sides. And that's going to allow me to apply the power rule. Power rule. Uh, 
I'm putting this in parentheses because this whole entire expression, this whole entire exponent, is what is apply, uh, multiplying the natural log of v. Now, again, there is, you know, there something that you just have to know at this point is that the natural log of e is equal to one. The natural log of e is equal to one. You just got to know that. So that means now we have 12 minus 5x is equal to the natural log of 130. Now we can, this is, this is like a linear equation that we can solve for x. All right, so what are we going to do first? How about we subtract the 12? Now, when we subtract a 12 like this, it is not the natural log of 130 minus 12. It's the natural log of 130, then you're subtracting 12. So don't think that um, we're doing the 130 first minus 12 and then doing the natural log. I don't, I don't even have – I mean, if, I guess even more clear would be put parentheses, but you don't have to do that. It's understood that – you're doing the natural log of 130, and then you're subtracting 12. And then I would divide both sides by negative uh, 5, and we get x is equal to the natural log of 130 minus 12 divided by a negative 5. Um, I typically don't like... Um, negatives down here in my denominator, so I might write this as the opposite of natural log of 130 minus 12 over 5. So I would accept that answer. Uh, this is also equivalent to, so let me rewrite this just a little bit because it looks like that minus sign is with the natural log. You could also rewrite this as if you distribute the negative to the numerator, I would write it as 12 minus the natural log of 130 all over 5. So it looks like we need to evaluate that. Where's my calculator? All right, clear. So in my calculator, I'm going to do – I'm going to open up a set of parentheses. 12 minus the natural log of 130. So make sure – so it opened up parentheses around that 130, so I need to close it once, close it twice, divide by 5, and we get approximately a 1. 1.4 – uh, around three decimal places, four to six. Now, if I want to check this, if I want to check this, I'm just going to go back to my uh, original statement. So, the nice thing is this is already stored in my calculator. So, if I do E, raised to the – trying to get this so that y'all can see this – e raised to 12 minus 5 second answer. So this answer is recalling what I just got, that negative uh, – what was it? 1.46. Uh, close parentheses, subtract 7, and that is this expression. If I hit enter, and I get 123, then we did it correctly. Ah, uh, look, 123. Now, again, um, in practice, we never ever leave a negative in the denominator. Um, so if you brought the negative out in front 
of the expression. Uh, that would be good. I even think it would be even better if you just distributed the negative sign up here into your numerator. Uh, that would be even less confusing. Um, so there is some good uh, practice techniques, I guess you could say, um, standard uh, ways of doing things. Um, not that this is incorrect, it's just not what you would see in practice, if that makes sense. All right, did that help with problem number 31? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're very welcome. What else can we look at? What else can we look at? Anything else? We do number 34. Say it one more time. Number 34. 34. 3 plus 4 times the natural log of 2x is equal to 15. All right, so this is um, this is a log equation, which the way that we typically solve logarithm equations is we rewrite in the exponential form. That's the, typically the way that we do this. So let's see what happens. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to think about uh, isolating the uh, natural log of 2x. See if I can't get that by itself. So I'd start off by subtracting the 3 on both sides. So 4 natural log of 2x is equal to 15 minus 3 is going to be 12. Oh, that looks nice. Then I can divide everything through by 4. Okay, so you got to remember what is the natural log? It's a logarithm with a base e. So remember that relationship for y equal to the log base b of x, that is equivalent to b to the y is equal to x. So this becomes my base is e, my exponent of 3 is equal to 2x. And then to get x by itself, I would divide both sides by 2, so that means that x is equal to e to the third divided by 2 which, using my calculator, is approximately, so in my calculator, I'm going to do e raised to the third. Now make sure that you close your parentheses around that three, then divide by two, 10.043. Now, this is a, I mean, I would I would just check this real quickly before I move on. So again, coming back up here, this is our x. It's already saved in my calculator as the answer. So let's just plug it in. 3 plus 4 times the natural log of 2 times second answer. So we have 3 plus 4 times the natural log of 2 times the second answer. And if I hit enter and I get 15, I did it correctly. Oh, 15. There we go. Does that make sense? 
Yes, sir. Good questions. What else can we look at? Can we do number four? Number four. We want to solve the inequality 3x plus 6 over x plus 3 is less than or equal to 2. Now, I mean, I only have 8 minutes, so I'm going to be rather quick about this. One way to do this would be to graph this and then draw a line at y equals 2 and see where the graph is less than 2. Uh, that requires graphing this and making sure that that's correct. The other way to do this is to uh, set this inequality uh, to be less than or equal to zero. So that would mean we would have 3x plus 6 over an x plus 3 minus 2 is less than or equal to zero. The problem with this is we now have a rational expression minus a whole number. We would like to rewrite this whole number um, so that we can combine it with this rational expression. So um, let's take that um, 2 and let's multiply it by a 1 that's made up of the denominator of our first term. So this gives us a 3x plus 6 over an x plus 3 uh, minus 2x minus 6 over an x plus 3 is less than or equal to 0. Now that these have the same denominator, we can put everything together. So 3x minus 2x is a 1x, and the 6 minus 6, that becomes 0. All right, so now let's stop right there. I, maybe I went a little bit quickly, but does it, do you see how we went from that original expression that was less than or equal to 2? and now got it to be less than or equal to zero. And we just did some basic algebra to get there. Does that make sense? Yes. So now what I would do is I'd start testing. Um, so just looking at this, I know that I have a vertical asymptote at um, x plus 3 equal to zero.
you're setting your denominator equal to zero, so that means you have a vertical asymptote at negative three. And I have a x-intercept at x equal to zero. Uh, and that's done by setting the numerator equal to zero. So keeping these two things in mind, I'm going to come back here to this expression on a number line. Here's my negative 3. Here's 0. And I would like to know when is this less than 0 or when is it negative? When is it less than or equal to 0? So I need to go through and do some test values. Uh, over here, um, I like to pick things that I can work with rather easily f at negative 10. So that's going to be negative 10 over a negative 10 plus 3. Well, negative 10 is negative. Negative 10 plus 3 is still going to be negative. So a negative divided by a negative is positive. Okay? Then f at, oh, between negative 3 and 0, how about negative 1? So you're going to get a negative 1 over a negative 1 plus 3. So that's going to be negative over a positive. Well, that's going to be negative. And then what's greater than 0? Um, let's just do 1. You could do 10, you could do 2, you could do whatever. Uh, you have 1 over a 1 plus 3. That's positive over a positive, which is positive. So what do we want to know? We want to know when the function is less than or equal to 0. Now, remember, this is your vertical asymptote. You cannot solid circle something at the vertical asymptote because that would mean you would include that x value. But we can solid circle this guy because it's an x-intercept. And where is this less than zero or where is it negative? It's negative right here. So all it says to do is solve the rational inequality. So, I mean, a graph is good, but the best way to express this would be using interval notation. So in interval notation, in interval notation, we would Your have conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Everything from negative three to zero inclusive. Now, this, the solution to this, negative three to zero, is the solution to our original um, question up here. So maybe I should just bring that up here. The answer is everything from negative three to zero. And we can test this. If you plugged in 0, 0, you get 6 over 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. That's great. Uh, if you plugged in negative 1, uh, you get a negative 3 plus 6 over a negative 1 plus 3. That's going to be 3 over a uh, 2, which 3 halves is a 1.5, which is still less than or equal to 2. If you plug in 3, here's why you can't plug in negative 3. Well, because negative 3 gives you 0 in your denominator. Um, and if you plugged in negative 4, uh, both the top and the bottom would be uh, positive because that would be negative and that would be negative and a 6 negative 6 over a negative 1 that would be more than 2 so that's why you can't plug in anything that's beyond negative 3 your conference is now over goodbye hey
Good question to everybody. I'll see y'all Wednesday. If you have any questions, let me know.